All right, so it's a pleasure to have Uli Bauer from uh, Munich today, who will be uh, telling us about the Gromov hyperbolicity geodesic defect and apparent pairs in RIPS filtration. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. And thanks to the organizers for uh, inviting me to present this work here. Um, I think it's, it's a particular uh, great pleasure to, to speak about this uh, topic because I think the, the, the topic was really like our interest in this, uh, these questions that we're gonna, um, and results that we're gonna present um, came um, from, from this very seminar where um, I, uh, some of the classical results from, from geometric group theory were, were presented and discussed in the context of persistence. And um, like the goal here is to create a bridge between the recent like computational aspects of Vitoris rips um, filtrations and their persistent homology on one side, and what's known like classically in hyperbolic geometry, where RIPS filtrations um, first appeared under this name by, by RIPS. And, and there is like, the, this is one of our main results that there is a very interesting link um, between like the computations and, and, and the, the, the theoretical results from the eighties. And one motivation that explains like this link and, and shows that this is actually of relevance in applications is, um, um, an application to the uh, evolution of, of viruses that was um, we're, we're working on with um, a group from Heidelberg um, led by Andreas Ott, Michael Blea and, and Lukas Ann involved and also uh, Juan, um, Juan Patino and, and Raul Rabadan from Colombia and Mathieu Carrier from INRIA um, are involved in this. And Roughly, the idea is that if you treat a large collection of sequenced viruses, and, and for COVID, we have now a huge database, much more complete picture of the entire disease and how it evolved over time. And it is very meaningful to study the genetic distances of, of these um, sequences um, using topological methods, using RIPS complexes and their homology. And the reason is if um, the evolution was really purely tree-like and every mutation that happens in this evolution would happen at a single nucleotide, then we would not see any persistent homology in degree greater than zero. So trees, and this is kind of well known, um, we'll get to this in a moment, trees don't have um, persistent homology um, above degree zero. And so anything that we see here uh, means that we somehow deviate from this kind of base assumption that the evolution is purely tree-like and everything mutates at a different place. And there's two kind of main reasons why this could happen. One is recombinations that has been suggested by Gunnar uh, Carson and, and Roald Radabadan and Andrew Chen in, um, in um, 2013 in a, in a um, well-known paper to our community. Like if you have a recombination, two viruses kind of um, combine to a new one, which is often um, related to outbreaks of viruses and influenza, and then this might surface as a one-dimensional feature in persistent homology. Um, so far, it seems that we haven't seen any of these recombinations in the COVID data set, but what we see is a lot of um, homoplasies, which is kind of other interesting events. And this means that we have the mutation of the same nucleotide happening at different um, instances of the virus. And this can also lead to very short-lived um, features in, in first degree homology. And we can detect those and they give us hints for, um, for uh, adaptive mutations, mutations that, that give a um, uh, evolutionary advantage and happen, occur in independently multiple times. And so that's, that's why this is really a very interesting scenario. Um, the data sets that we have from the, this database GIS8 is huge. And so um, the, the computation, like we are, we're talking about um, 10,000s or even 100,000s of, of points. And you might know, like even with the fastest methods, usually this is not um, gonna happen. You, you won't be able to compute uh, persistent homology even in degree one with such large data sets. But we were surprised to see that for this particular type of data, it was possible. and. And combining the uh, like the just the software that that ha has existed for a while, with the new insights that we we found here, we actually obtained another huge speed up. Like uh, utilizing the the findings of, that we're gonna see today, um, we could bring down the computation from one day to about two minutes, 
uh, in, in a certain um, type of data set here. And, and, and the nice thing is this is even without changing a single line of code. It's just about um, ordering the data points in the right way to make use of this particular structure. Um, in particular, we, we need to order it in a way that's compatible with the tree. And, and just that we will see that this is kind of what's needed in the theorem. And it also like, it's also what's needed in practice to get this huge uh, speed up for this particular type of data sets, tree-like tree -like metric data. And it, it's also enough that the, the actual data that set that we're working with is not exactly tree-like, but it's almost a tree, right? Um, because we, we do see persistent homology, but it's, it's, it's sufficiently tree-like that we see the speed. Okay, so that's what we're going to aim for, and we, we want to combine classical findings about RIPS complexes with uh, what's like the tricks that are used in RIPSA to speed up the computation. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, the first motivation. The second motivation, as I said, is the, the famous uh, lemma by RIPS about a collapses of, of uh, RIPS complexes. Um, well, it, it seems that RIPS told this um, this theorem to, to Gromov, and Gromov uh, was the first to actually write up a proof in his famous paper about hyperbolic groups, but he attributes it to, to RIPS. And the statement says, if you have something called a delta hyperbolic and, and a geodesic space, then um, if for a large enough parameter, T, namely greater than four delta, this RIPS complex at that parameter becomes contractible, homotopy equivalent to a point. And, and well, if we think about this from, from the perspective of TDA, of course, we don't have uh, geodesic spaces. We deal mostly with finite metric spaces. And so that's a natural question, like, is there a version of this statement for non-geodesic spaces, in particular finite metric spaces? And of course, the question is, like, we are interested in, if we compute persistence, we are interested in observations like these. Something becomes collapsible, so we can stop computing. And so can we somehow utilize um, this and, and can we maybe draw a connection to uh, the construction of apparent pairs that plays a central role in the computation in RIPSA? So that's gonna be our second motivation. Somehow linking this classical contractibility um, result with, with persistence computations. So let me recall what chromophyphobicity is. Um, and, and I'm gonna state the version of this um, definition that applies to arbitrary metric spaces. We, I don't require them to be geodesic. And so a metric space is delta hyperbolic if um, we have the following setup, whenever we pick four points, and then we look at this kind of tetrahedron, we imagine a tetrahedron spanned um, like by, by these four points, but this is kind of just um, uh, a, a way to, to um, summarize the distances, the pairwise distances between all of these points in four points. And what we have is whenever we take the sum of two um, opposite edges, if you want. So the, the sum of, of opposite um, um, pairwise distances, um, like between X and W here and, and Y and Z, then should, this should be less than, less or equal than the maximum of the other two su such sums plus uh, possibly a, a factor of two delta that we allow ourselves to get. And um, so this is a simple way to express um, hyperbolicity. And well, the name of course comes from the fact that if the, the, the hyperbolic plane um, has this property of certain for a certain delta. So it, it is somehow related to negative curvature. Um, there are other notions of hyperbolicity in the, in the literature and they, and differ by this one, maybe by a constant factor. So often people are just interested in the fact that there exists a delta. We are more interested also in, in the question what this delta actually is, because we wanna, we wanna use it, right? Not, not just in an asymptotic way, but we wanna really get our hands on this. Yeah, one thing also to note is that a metric tree is a special case of a zero, or zero hyperbolic space. So this is kind of the, the most negatively curved space that you can imagine. And, and as I said, metric trees are also of special interest to us. So that's hyperbolicity. And okay, so let's see, this is one first um, result um, framed using these um, notions that, that it slightly extends what, what um, is classically known if we um, consider a delta hyperbolic metric space without requiring um, that the space be um, geodesic. 
then uh, the ribs complex becomes contractible. As soon as we uh, reach a parameter greater than four delta plus two times a parameter nu, that's called the geodesic defect. Um, this is what we, uh, like the name we introduced for this quantity. And um, before we explain what this geodesic defect is, just another um, variant of this um, theorem, because we, we are interested in filtrations more than just the sim sim complexes, we also um, set up a filtered version of the previous uh, theorem. Um, and this filtered version says like whenever um, you are above this um, um, threshold for delta plus two nu, then um, you can actually um, express the, the um, contractibility of these complexes. And you can express them by a single discrete gradient for all parameters that are above the threshold. So this is more a technical statement saying that uh, what we've seen in the previous um, version of the theorem can be done expressed using discrete Morse theory um, with a single gradient, not one for each parameter. And so, so the collapses that we construct in this way are also compatible with the, the RIPS filtration, with the natural filtration parameter. So this, is, this might be more exciting to you if you are actually into the, these technicalities, but, but you see this is kind of helpful if you, if you would like to work with the language that we, um, that it's common and, and natural to us. So this is, this is kind of the statements that we're going for. Um, okay, let me explain what this geodesic, uh, sorry, this, yeah, this geodesic defect um, really says. It, it's based on the observation. If you work in a honest geodesic space, like Euclidean space, and you have two closed balls or around centered at different points, then they intersect as soon as the, the sum of their radii is greater or equal to the distance of these points. This is very natural. But of course, in general, like just take a, a finite subset, right? If, if, you, if you look at the picture below and only these, these, these dots inside these, these balls are what I consider now as the spaces, then uh, the, the, the balls, the, the balls um, of, uh, within these finite metric spaces might actually have to have larger radii before we see the first intersection point. So this kind of illustrates that, that um, geodesic spaces um, have, in a sense, geodesic defect zero, but um, like how much you have to increase the radii of the balls in, in order to ensure an intersection is exactly the geodesic defect. So this is the definition now. Like you see in the picture, here's the formal definition, the geodesic defect of a metric space is the infimum new, this is the quantity by which you in, increase the radii of the balls to ensure that they always intersect whenever I take two points X and Y uh, and, and two radii, um, initial radii R and S, uh, such that their sum is um, the distance of the two points X and Y. Okay, so that's, that's the, the geodesic defect illustrated by what we have seen in the previous slide. So this idea, um, well, we, we somehow stumbled on this idea by reading a paper by Urs Lang where he used this idea implicitly in, in a proof for a special case, he only considered um, uh, spaces where the, the minimum distance between points is, is one. This is all very, very combinatorial. And what then we found like in, in, a, in a sausage review, um, we, we were told that actually the, the very same um, definition um, also appeared in this paper by Bonk and Schramm. Um, well, the, they talk about an almost geodesic space or wh where basically this means that they, there exists a new, this would be a new geodesic, uh, new almost geodesic space if these conditions are satisfied for this new. And also there's a paper, recent paper by uh, Joinat and Joost where a, a local version of this, so only for a pair, a single pair of X and Y, and, and also, in, in a sense, a multiplicative version of this condition is used. It's similar in spirit, but different in, in the definition. So these ideas um, surface at, at various places in the literature. OK. Um, now, you, you may ask yourself, like, if I, how, how can I bound this geodesic defect using other quantities I know about my metric space? There's a lower bound if you if you work with finite metric spaces, um, and that's one half the smallest pairwise distance between any pair of points that gives you a lower bound on the geodesic defect. 
And there's also an upper bound, but you need some some uh, some room to to explore this upper bound. You need an, a, a geodesic ambient space in which you can embed your space X. So you embed it into some geodesic um, space Z isometrically. And then um, you, you look at the house of distance of this embedding within the ambient space, the density of X in Z, if you want. And that provides an upper bound for the geodesic defect. And um, such embeddings into ambient spaces are very common. We have, we, we have a, a few very natural examples. Um, there's the Kuratowski embedding um, that um, works for any metric space X and embeds it into the function space, the L infinity space of X. And um, closely related to that is the tight span, uh, which is actually a subspace of the sum function space. And, and, and the Kuratowski embedding actually um, maps into the tight span. Um, so this is the definition here. There's a very nice um, explicit formula for um, the tight span. You take all functions f such that the sum of function values at, at taken at points x and y is greater or equal to the distance between x and y. And well, this inequality is tight, like whenever, um, whenever you fix one point x, then there exists another point y for which this um, um, this um, inequality is, is um, obtained tightly. I think this is this is um, a statement that's true at least when the metric space is finite. Otherwise, you might have to put a supreme here. Um, okay, so some properties that we that that are helpful to to play with the tight span as is a nice um, kind of simplest possible way to turn a, a metric space into into something geodesic by enlarging it. Um, well, it is a geodesic space. It is hyperconvex, which means that, that we have this heli property for metric balls. And that's also equivalent to saying <clears throat> that the, the space is an injective object in the category of metric spaces with a new usual notion that, that's familiar from homological algebra. Um, yeah, and as, as I mentioned, um, the Kuratowski embedding is actually in mapping into the tight span. And in fact, um, the tight span is the smallest possible space with respect to inclusion that satisfies these um, four above mentioned properties. And another important aspect for us that very helpful, uh, the tight span is always contractible. And now this is something you, you I think you, you might have heard um, by Facundo's talk um, while back in, in the seminar already. Um, I'm just recalling this because it, it we can also give a very nice, um, uh, proof of, of one of the theorems we have seen before using this machinery. Um, all we need is a um, this theorem that's basically due to was Lang um, plus epsilon because he did he did prove the theorem but he didn't state it in this general form. But what he proved like his proof actually uh, goes uh, applies more generally um, to to um, spaces with geodesic defect new. Um, and he only considered the case where this defect was one half. But you don't have to change a single line of the proof to have this. So this is very nice. And it says, like, if you take a delta hyperbolic space with geodesic defect nu and you look at the Kurtowski embedding into the tight span. So what is the distance of this embedded version of X in the tight span? Um, house of distance to, to the tight span itself. So, so how, how dense, in a sense, sits this um, X in, in its tight span. And this is <clears throat> bounded above by two delta plus the geodesic defect, right? And that's uh, nice because now um, you can actually give a uh, con um, contractibility result as a pretty straightforward corollary of this theorem. Uh, together with a, a few other facts that I mentioned. Uh, Hyperconvexity, which tells us that rips and check complexes are the same um, up to, up to um, yeah, a, a constant change in parameters. So the 2R rips complex of X is the check, the ambient check complex of uh, this Kurtowski embedding of X uh, in, into its tight span with parameter R. So these are the same complexes. Um, yeah, for for um, if 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 we take a radius larger than two delta plus nu, then these uh, these balls with these radii centered at the at the points 
of uh, the embedded version of X. And they, these balls already cover the entire tight span. This is what the host of condition tells us. So uh, in particular, it, by the nerve lemma, um, these balls are also um, convex and, and, and um, intersections of them are also convex. So, so everything is nice and the nerve lemma applies and tells us like if this radius is large enough so that the balls cover the entire tight span, well then this, this nerve, this check complex will also be um, contractible. And well, it, it will be homotopy equivalent to the tight span. That's the first step, but we know that the tight span itself is contractible. So it's very, a very clean conceptual proof. Um, maybe not, it, it doesn't give us the, the, the full strength of what we can actually show, but, but it, this shows like where these numbers come from. And with, with a very nice um, napkin outline of, 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 of the proof, right? Um, right, so here's the corollary. Um, the ribs complexes of X um, are contractible as, as soon as we reach this parameter for delta plus two new that we've seen before. Okay, so that's that's good motivation, right? And that's that's kind of what why why these um, ideas are very useful to to navigate through through these um, uh, these results about contractibility. What we um, of course what we would like to have is to make things more explicit. Somehow, the, applying the nerve theorem is always a bit um, is a bit roundabout because like if you look into the proof of the nerve theorem, there's a there's a kind of detour through some homotopy co-limit that we're taking and, and we want to see this uh, collab, this con, um, contractibility more explicitly and maybe also more directly. And uh, so in particular, the way we have just shown this statement is not given by an explicit collapse that we can just write down in terms of a discrete gradient vector field. So, but what we can do is we can also look in, into, and what we did is we looked into the, the original proof um, written up by Gromov of, of Ripses lemma. And we try to translate this into, um, into the language of discrete Morse theory. And we achieved the following statement um, that we have seen before. I think also in, uh, we can write down a single discrete gradient um, on the full simplex um, um, with vertices X that induces these collapses um, uh, as soon as we reach, um, as soon as we reach the threshold for delta plus, new, uh, plus two nu. So um, this is kind of a, a entirely different argument from the one that we've seen before, but, but it really picking up the ideas um, from, from the original proof and making it, um, recouching it in, in terms of this discrete Morse theory, making it co compatible with the filtration uh, and also in incorporating the geodesic defect into the result. Okay, so that's basically what can be said about the what we found about the general case, general um, metric spaces, and all finite metric spaces are delta hyperbolic for some delta, and they all have some finite um, uh, geodesic defects. So this is meaningful in in any instance of finite metric spaces. Okay, so let's let's turn to like the second part, which is about tree metrics, and we have seen at the beginning of the seminar the uh, the motivation for tree metrics. And let's first look at the generic case because that's the easiest and we can see some very nice structure here. That means gener generic means we have a, a, a finite tree with weights, which, and, and then the, we turn that into a metric space where the distances are given by the, um, the paths, the weighted paths in the tree. And if I assume that the, the pairwise distances resulting from this are all distinct, then I call this a generic um, finite tree metric. And the nice thing about this genericity, it seems to be not very much of a um, restriction, like in Morse theory. <clears throat> and it actually is, it leads to a diameter function that's a generalized discrete Morse function. Meaning that uh, the, there's a partition into critical simplices and, and non-critical simplices, which are clustered in intervals in the phase poset. And uh, yeah, the, the classical discrete Morse theory uh, it, it originally introduced by Foreman has intervals only um, of, of size two. And this is a slight generalization that, that doesn't like really change any of the results. And well, so what do these intervals look like? The lower bound, so it, it's given by a collection, an interval is a collection of simplices 
with a common face and a common coface. And the common face, so the lower bound of the interval is always an edge in this case, a non-tree edge. And then the, the upper uh, bound is uh, a, a unique maximal coface with the same diameter, the same length. And that's one observation that in, in the case of trees, we actually have this unique maximal coface. In, in general, that's not true. Um, it's easy to set up metrics where you have multiple uh, maximal cofaces for an edge. But for trees, it's always new. That's nice. And, and so you can write down in this generic case, you can really write down this gradient very explicitly. And this is what it is. And in particular, it's notable that now only the, um, the vertices and the edges of the original tree are critical simplices and everything else um, is, 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 um, appears in these intervals. And that means that the entire um, the entire tree and uh, so sorry the the entire ribs complex at every scale actually uh, collapses to the corresponding subforest given by filtering the edges. So everything collapses in in a filtration compatible way to this tree. This is kind of summarizing. Um, yeah, that that this is how you see that that tree metrics don't have any interesting persistent homology um, above degree zero. So this is for. Whoops, my. This is for the generic case. Let's turn. Um, oops. Um, yeah, here, here's a slide summarizing what what this implies. Uh, we have two types of collapses. This is what I just said. The ribs complex at any parameter collapses to a tree, or well, actually a subforest of the the full tree. Um, filtered by by the edge weights, and also whenever we are between um, two distance values of the edges, then uh, the ribs complex might still change because we also have um, path lengths distances. So um, uh, this is like whenever we 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 choose two parameters u and t, and in between there is no. Um, there's there's no edge length of the actual original tree. Then these ribs complexes will not necessarily be the same, but one will collapse. The larger one will collapse to the small one, and this is also encoded in this tree. And the, the reason is simply that well, only the only the trees uh, the tree edges um, are critical simplices in this gradient. So and every, everything else is not critical, and and that um, gives us this collapse. And then. Um, yeah, in particular, when as soon as we reach the maximum length of any edge in the tree, the ribs complex will be um, collapsible. It will collapse to the tree, and the tree can collapse itself to a point. And this also shows that we don't have any persistent homology. Okay, um, so the generic situation is nice. In 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 practice, we often don't have genericity, so we have to um, think a bit harder. Um, you can still do something very interesting for general tree metrics. And one example that we have seen before, the, these phylogenetic trees, uh, the metric is certainly not generic. We have a lot of distances one. And so the diameter function as a result will not necessarily be a discrete Morse function. So we can't apply the nice machinery that we have. But nevertheless, even in the most general and, and most weird cases of metrics with, with a lot of values coinciding, we still have a certain compatible gradient. And what's nice about this one, I, I don't wanna give the definition here. Um, you can look it up in the paper, but what's notable about this one is it's still independent of any choices. So I can, I can set up the gradient in a way that doesn't require me to sort uh, edges or vertices in a particular order. And so that's why we call it a canonical gradient. And well, what's also nice if in the case that we have a generic tree metric, this is actually coinciding with the, the gradient of this diameter function. So it, it strictly generalizes what we have seen before. In particular, this one also will only have the vertices and edges of the tree critical. And so we have the same statement uh, of induced collapses as before. Over, can I ask a yeah. quick question? Yeah. Is there picture that I should have in mind, this full picture um, convincing me that uh, if it's not a generic tree, then the diameter might not be a discrete Morse function. 
Yeah, maybe I, I have a picture on the next slide or one. Oh, perfect. That's, maybe that's good to um to 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 play um at least if you don't see everything in this picture, but it's it's good it, it's good enough to see that something will um go wrong. Um yeah, here it is, right? So this is actually leading to uh, the next step, but we can we can look at the picture first and and see what what happens. Um so the, the the this is the tree and let's say that the the edges all have length one and then you see at length two a, a diameter two um these blue edges um appear and so you already see that so and 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 after like at diameter two the the full simplex is is the ribs complex so you already see that this is now not a generalized discrete Morse function because the collection of simplices with diameter two um, is is a is an upset of the, these three edges so it's kind of fringed yeah okay that so that's and and what, what we're gonna do here now um, is uh, like another way of, of, of re restoring this um, situation so another way of getting a, a gradient uh, which is different from the one we have seen before, but they're closely related. And this is basically following the idea of symbolic perturbation that's very commonly used in computational geometry for, for Delaunay uh, triangulations. So we want to pretend that the edges, um, that we have this genericity condition by, by sorting the edges in some way, like what the strategy here is, we first choose a total order on the vertices. So now that's a choice, it's a not non-canonical construction. And then we order the edges lexicographically with respect to this. And then we pretend that the edges are actually um, ordered in this way. And as it turns out, this also gives a gradient structure and it gives the same kind of structure like for the generic trees. In particular, it gives a discrete gradient in which all the lower bounds are edges again. In contrast to the one that we've seen before, the canonical gradient has, um, has lower bounds that are not edges sometimes. And but the connection between these two, the symbolic perturbation strategy, and the one from uh, the slide before, this canonical gradient, is uh, that the canonical gradient actually refines any any possible uh, way of perturbing the gradient. So so meaning that the intervals um, are further partitioned. The, the intervals of a perturbed gradient are further partitioned. By the canonical gradient, and what what I mean by this is, in particular, they have the same critical simplices, and hence, in, in a sense, they, from the Morse theory perspective, they tell us the same thing, just in different ways. And there's pros and cons to both, right? The symbolic perturbation maybe is is, is very natural to to think about, like how how you derive it. Uh, the canonical gradient is nice because um, it doesn't require any choices. Here we make a choice of total order. And well, the canonical gradient is actually the, the simplest one for us to prove uh, the statements that we have seen before. And then just by verifying that this perturbed gradient somehow um, coarsens the canonical gradient tells us we have the same properties also for this perturbed gradient. So this feels a bit like we're, we're um, on a path now. We, we're, we're going for something. As you remember, we want to talk about apparent pairs. And in a sense, the symbolic perturbation is, a, is an intermediate step for us. The canonical gradient is something where we have a nice proof. Then this symbolic perturbation is, um, um, it has a, maybe a, a simpler structure, but makes choices. But OK, let's, let's, before we move on, let's just see, um, let's just look at this example to, to illustrate the, the symbolic perturbation and what happens here. So um, I, I have these four vertices and I have this, this, this uh, tripod tree here and they're, they're ordered A, B, C, D. So now if I look at the symbolic perturbation, it means I insert the, the edge B, C first and then um, together with, with all, um, all required cofaces. So this edge comes together with a triangle ABC. And then uh, in the next step, I insert the edge BD together with a triangle ABD. And then in the third step, I insert the edge DC together with everything else. So the first 
two steps here. Um, the intervals are actually pairs. And in the last step, the interval has four elements. In, in particular, it has the, the full tetrahedron ABCD. And so that's the perturbed gradient. And in contrast, the canonical gradient, which I haven't defined here, but I can tell you uh, that the canonical gradient um, is, is finer in the sense that you have, um, in the last step, you also have this um, edge, this last edge CD together with the triangle ACD. And then you have another interval consisting of the triangle BCD and the tetrahedron ABCD. So that's maybe to, to give you a flavor of, of how these compare. So yeah, and I think it's nice if you if you if you revisit this using the paper, it's, it's good to have these examples at hand, which are also on, on the archive version of the paper, where we give um, this example and all possible gradients. Okay, so let's move on um, to the apparent pairs. And we want to connect what we have seen to apparent pairs because they are kind of a, a key um, ingredient in RIPSA and making RIPSA fast. And it's a very general idea that, that um, I think many people uh, discovered independently, interestingly, at around the same time, like five years ago. So it, it shows up in Greg Henselman's work on Irene. And um, it, it shows up in RIPSA. There's a paper by uh, Leon Lumpret. Um, so it, I think in Vanessa Robbins, one of Vanessa Robbins' paper, the idea shows up. And the way I um, got this idea is by studying a construction by Matt Kahl for, um, for a special case. And I try to generalize it and, and try to find a simple way of expressing what he's been doing so I can understand it better. So it's a very nice and simple way of assigning a discrete gradient to a simplicial complex. And all you need is you need to filter the simplicial complex simplex by simplex. That's why what I usually call a simplex wise filtration. So the Simplices are totally ordered. And then we can form pairs, sigma tau, where uh, sigma is the latest proper phase of tau. And conversely, tau is the earliest proper co-phase of sigma. So these two simplices are in some sense closer to each other than to any other simplex. So it's a very romantic relationship between simplices that leads to this um, very strong properties that they both form persistence pairs in this simplex wise filtration, but they also form a discrete gradient in the sense of Foreman. So they provide a very nice link between persistence and Morse theory um, in, in the settings that we care about computationally. And well, in RIPSA, we use this for the special case of um, RIPS with a lexicographic refinement. So we first order the simplices by diameter. And if they have the same diameter, we just order them lexicographically. So that's the type of apparent pairs that I, I have in mind. And you can show um, actually that like the, the RIPS lemma, the collapsibility lemma um, holds for this particular um, discrete gradient of apparent pairs. So uh, the requirements are we have a finite metric tree and we impose a total order on the vertices. Um, we choose an arbitrary vertex in the tree and then we sort um, the, the, the other vertices away from the root. So we extend this kind of tree order that's given this partial order that's given by choosing a, a, a root and we extend it in any way to a total order. And if you have done this, so with this particular choice of total order, you get an apparent pairs gradient that induces the collapses that we care about. So uh, on one side, um, each RIPS complexes collapses, it, it collapses to the corresponding subforest, the edges uh, with uh, length at most T. And on the other hand, like across the filtration, you have um, RIPS complexes collapse um, like a larger RIPS complex collapses uh, to a smaller one if there were no critical values um, in between. In particular, if there were no distances of the, of the tree edges um, appearing as values in between. So this is the kind of statement that we had before. And well, the proof is really, again, very, no, it's, it's, it's not as simple as it looks like here, but, but, but the, the idea, the thing that we have to prove is that these apparent pairs actually in turn, refine the perturbed gradient that we've seen before. Again, this means that we have the same critical uh, simplices, namely only the vertices and edges. 
And so in, in a sense, what we did is we considered three gradients. We started with this canonical one, then we talked about the perturbed gradient, and then the apparent pairs gradient, and we kind of carried over what we understand from the canonical gradient and to the other gradients, including this one that we care about most. Right, and um, this is kind of hiding that the, the proof of this um, of, of this last um, theorem is a bit technical actually, but that's kind of the, the idea that we're aiming for. Okay, and I guess with this, um, at the end of this talk. So let's just summarize what you've seen. We, um, we were interested in Rips lemmas beyond just geodesic spaces, in particular finite metric spaces. And we introduced the geodesic de defect to extend the known results about collapsibility. We also made these results fin filtration compatible, which is something that people in, in, in uh, geometric group theory had no reason to care about, but we have a lot of reason to care about. And also couching things in, in terms of collapses in discrete most theory um, is something that, of course, um, only came up um, later on. So this is also something important to us. And yeah, for trees, we could make this very nice connection explaining why RIPSA runs fast if you sort <clears throat> the points in a particular way. And now what we learned um, is that you, I, I, I said like here, the, the order is um, RIPS lexicographic. Uh, RIPS actually uses the reverse lexicographic order. So we don't have to order the, the vertices uh, uh, starting from the root and then away from the root, but in the opposite direction towards the root. Like you, you sort them in this way and then you reverse it for technical reasons that this is what RIPS is using. And um, so we, we we try to do this in the COVID data, and that means that we we sorted the the um, data points in in reverse chronological order. And before we had it in forward chronological order, and that 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 was the only thing we had to do to bring down the computation time from one day to two minutes. Right? It's just take the data points and reverse them, and all of a sudden things are very fast. And they were fast before, but now, now they're extremely fast. And the reason is like we, we understand now um, with this proof, at least <clears throat> at least heuristically, um, because this proof is for actually honest tree metrics and we have kind of approximate tree metrics, but that's kind of our explanation for why we see this speed up and, and like it, it guides you to what, what you need to do if you know that your data sets are close to being a tree metric. Okay, that's, that's all I have to say, but if you have any further questions, um, that you haven't asked, feel free to ask now. Thank you. Right, I suggest we unmute ourselves to thank Uli. Are there any questions? I'm happy to jump in first if people are shy. So, um, Uli, um, I really like your uh, theoretical, you know, explanation. That's sort of also um, uh, a heuristic explaining why this computation goes so fast. Do you think there's any room to potentially sort of, um, I don't know. Uh, turn this from a heuristic to sort of even even theoretical and sort of the uh, non-tree setting. I, I don't know, some sort of context. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Yeah, close to a tree, but not yeah. quite. Yet. Right, right. I think that's a good, that's a very good, that's a very natural question. Like <clears throat> what is, I guess, and it it will like the, the final result of this will probably be the right definition of almost like in, in a quantitative way, almost tree metry that allows you to to make this connection, but yeah, it, it's certainly possible because I mean, you will basically just have to count the number of times in which <clears throat> the the assumptions are violated and how uh, this will lead to extra critical points in the gradients that we construct, and you would just have to make sure that um, yeah that that those those extra critical points don't explode and then you have then you have a kind of statement that you can try to prove but that's that's a very good idea right why not why not make this from a heuristic into an 
into a statement in, in whatever form. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very optimistic that such a thing should be possible. Yeah, I like that idea, yeah. Could I ask a question about apparent errors? Yeah. So uh, if you don't mind going to the slide. Um, uh, yeah, uh, here is we are. Like if you're in, if you're not in a generic situation, I mean, is there ever a possibility for sort of ties? Like sigma could be with either tau and tau prime, or does yeah. that never happen? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. So, so um, I mean, here the setup is is generic in the sense, like the genericity is is uh, created by assuming that the filtration is simplex wise, right? And if so maybe that's the, the question. If you have a filtration already and it's not, um, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's not generic, then uh, it's not simplex wise, then what can you do? So there's also something I haven't mentioned, but we're using this in the paper and it's, it's good to know, I think. Um, if you have a generalized discrete Morse function, then there is a canonical way of um, still, like re refining the discrete gradient of this Morse function in a in a way that gives you, uh, in a way that the pairs of the refinement are exactly apparent pairs for a certain natural um, way of turning this into a simplex wise filtration. And this is exactly given by by um, combining um, like breaking ties in a lexicographic order, like we do. So this is this is also part of the machinery here. So you. You have a discrete gradient uh, vector field. You have a discrete Morse function. For example, the the, no, the Lonnie function or the check function are, are of this type, right? So, so it's a very common situation. And on top of that, all, all you need to choose is a total order on the vertices. And this gives you a total order on the simplices. And then um, the you can you can express uh, the apparent pairs resulting from the simplex wise filtration. Um, also in a in a very nice explicit way, it's kind of you you um, you pair a, a basically every every simplex with um, with its co-face with the smallest vertex, uh, like the, the smallest additional vertex in a sense. So so that's we have a name for this. I forgot um, uh, ver minimal vertex refinement, I think. So so there's kind of two viewpoints on the same construction. You can view them as apparent pairs. And um, we have we have used this kind of refining generalized gradients into into Foreman type gradients um, before we thought about apparent pairs. So, but it seems that some somehow they lead to the same ideas. So yeah, that's that's one instance of tie breaking um, that happens to to work well and and um, like it, it leads to something that's good for um, good for the working mathematician, right? And good to deal with in proofs, I think. Yeah. No more questions for Uli? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for your very nice talk. So I was wondering this notion of apparent pairs. Uh, is this giving a mean to uh, understand what are the final critical cells that get paired in the persistence? So they are not a part of apparent pairs, but those that have non-zero persistence, is it a way to uh, kind of only uh, leave non-paired uh, cells that are critical, but then they are themselves paired using persistence, but non-zero persistence, or is it not equivalent? Um, it is so. It is not equivalent in in two ways. The, the way the apparent pairs here are defined. I mean, this is something you mentioned already. Um, so you you're evidently aware of this. Apparent pairs might have positive persistence, right? So they they then they they actually show up as persistence pairs. And by right, the way they are used in Ripsa is really those apparent those persistence pairs that are only introduced uh, in the simplex wise filtration, uh, which is a refinement of a coarser filtration, but they don't contribute to persistence of the coarser filtration. So, right, so, so on, on one hand, 
apparent pairs might um, have persistence themselves. On the other hand, you might not be able to um, cover every zero persistence pairs using apparent pairs. It's a like if you if you focus on the zero apparent pairs, which is like commonly done, um, the, the kind of these local pairs, you might just not get everything. Like and, and this is why um, in certain situations it, it's it's nice that you do get everything. In particular, it's the case for generalized discrete most functions. In if for, in a generalized discrete most function, if you construct it the same uh, the way I just sketched, uh, then you will catch every non-critical point as a is a zero persistence pair and you might still have some of the uh, non-zero persistence pairs also showing up as a parent pairs but there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between simplices that appear in uh, so so the simplices that appear in zero apparent pairs are precisely the non-critical um, simplices of the generalized um, discrete Morse function so, but that, this is right. This is particular to discrete most functions, and for general filtrations, I mean, this is kind of um, it's 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 difficult to actually achieve this. Okay. And, I mean, the and, good and, thing and, about, yeah. about yeah. Uh, sorry, and and for instance, if you have because a lot of uh, people in applications use cubical complexes from images mm -hmm. and lower uh, set filtration, and so a uh, sublevel set. So my question is, do we now understand perfectly well which are those critical cells that have non-zero persistence in the diagrams? Because normally we should be able to interpret the diagram. No, we don't know no, them. No, 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 this is hard. This is actually, a hard, I mean, in it, the cubical setting is structured, but if you, if you um, ask for simplicial still, right? You can like this question, you can hide very many uh, hard problems like uh, sphere recognition or, or ball recognition. So, and and where you can couch it in this way, like, uh, am I am I getting just the the right number of critical cells? If you could do that, then you could you could recognize a three sphere, and that's basically um, well, as far as we know right now, we we don't even know whether that's uh, NP a hard problem or not. Um, but but this is touching on like. On, on the hard problems in, in three-dimensional topology, combinatorial oh, three-dimensional topology. And th this doesn't resolve the, the question now. The, the, the apparent pairs, I mean, they're more, like in the absence of a discrete Morse function, they're more like a heuristic, but they're very good heuristic. And, and I mean, they have been used in, in very many ways in theory and in practice. But um, like you need, you need a lot of structure if you really wanna make sure that you cover everything. And if you're not, uh, if you can't guarantee that structure, then then you can like th they give you kind of one-sided bounds. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Or any um, final comments or questions for Uli? All right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Julie, for a fantastic talk. And thank you.